over the next four weeks, we're going to be discussing this, the cross. Because this cross defines all humanity. The characters that we're going to discuss, people of the Word of God, all came to the cross with their own personalities, with their own life. They all experienced the cross differently. Some embraced the cross. Some even caused the cross. Some died because of the cross. But all the characters that we are going to see over the next four weeks encountered the cross. And it all started in the Garden of Eden when sin entered into this world. Because of that sin, the cross was made known. Because if it wasn't for the cross, we would not have our salvation. And the Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, it says this, As for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified, and the world's interest in me has also died. The cross becomes the focus, the focal point of everything that we do in this church and in our life. I can glory about nothing but the cross. So over these next few weeks, you're going to experience individuals, characters of the Word of God that we can put our identification into. We can say, I understand him. I can be like him. Or, man, I was like that. Maybe I can identify with a character or maybe multiple characters. But the 12 characters over the next four weeks, you will identify with one or two of those characters. The first character that encountered the cross was the one man who probably caused, other than the sovereign will of God, the physical act of Jesus dying on the cross was the religious leader, the high priest of the day. His name was Caiaphas. Shalom. My name is Joseph Caiaphas. My title is High Priest. Some call me a puppet. I am here today to tell you I am not. They obviously have no understanding of the strength of family ties. They know nothing of my loyalty to my father. Actually, my father-in-law, as you would call him. His name is Annas and he is perhaps the most powerful Jew in all of Palestine. It is because of him that I am high priest. He had my predecessor removed so that I may take the office. Yes, it's true. Once a high priest, always a high priest. My father-in-law, Annas. Even though he still has the power, I have the office and all the riches that go with it. So, I usually do his bidding, yes. And you see, the events of that night are not entirely of my doing. What events, you wonder? Allow me to explain. It all started when the temple guards brought a prisoner into the courtyard of our home. It was very late. They took him first to Annas, which is fine with me, I'm used to being second. Whenever there is a quarrel for the high priest to decide, the matter is brought to me for a hearing, but not before Annas has heard it first. So, Annas interviewed the prisoner while I dressed. After all, I was in bed when they brought him in. Afterwards, I went down to the great hall where the chief priests and many members of the Sanhedrin had gathered. And there he was, standing in chains, Jesus of Nazareth. They presented their accusations. This man is guilty of blasphemy, and his case must be decided immediately. Immediately. Blasphemy. That is a capital offense, punishable by death. I hastily convened a meeting of the Sanhedrin to hear the evidence against Jesus. Frankly, 
there was not much evidence to go on. We did not have much of a case. The initial interview by Annis had turned up nothing that we could use. I knew that we would need more evidence if we were to make the charges stick, which we must. So, what do I do with Jesus? I sent him to the dungeon. There, the guards beat him mercilessly for hours until they were exhausted. Yes, they beat him. A call went out through Jerusalem. Bring me evidence. Bring me witnesses to Jesus' blasphemy. We must have more. And so, shortly before dawn, I reconvened the Sanhedrin. Witnesses came forward, claiming to have heard Jesus make blasphemous statements. But there was a problem. No two witnesses could agree on the facts. No two stories were the same in the whole lot. I knew if we could not get some clear, hard evidence, I would have no choice but to dismiss the case. I was getting frustrated. The Sanhedrin was getting angrier and angrier and angrier. Finally, I couldn't take any more. I asked Jesus point blank, are you the Son of God? Throughout this whole ordeal, Jesus had not said a single word. But now, but now, he says two simple words. I am. The room exploded. There were shouts of, kill him, traitor, blasphemer, kill him. I tore my clothes in disgust, but I knew deep in my heart this whole thing was wrong. This was not a trial. First of all, the timing was bad. Our law states no trial shall be held at night. It was almost dawn. We had been up almost all night trying this case. Next, why was Jesus here before us? Jesus was here before us only because of a bribe paid to one of his followers. This poor man was in front of us only because of a few pieces of silver. His life hung in the balance. Next, we ask the witness, or we ask Jesus to incriminate himself, which he readily did, but clearly against our laws. And here I was, ready to pronounce a capital sentence. What's wrong with that? Isn't that my job? Yes. However, our law again states, a full day must pass between a conviction and a pronouncement of a sentence. We could not wait, however. The Passover was upon us. Oh, it was tough. It was tough. I could feel my father's eyes on me, just waiting to see what I would do. I could feel his will beating down on me like a hot summer sun. I really had no choice, you see. I knew what I had to do. It was I, Caiaphas, that proclaimed the innocent Nazarene guilty of blasphemy and worthy of death. What else could I do? Don't you understand the power of my family? I'm not a puppet! I am an obedient son. That night, in that room, a simple man submitted himself to the will of his father. That's all. That's all. Shalom. That is a true statement. That night, a man submitted himself to the will of his father. But that man was not Caiaphas. That man was Jesus. 
the religious leaders of the day thought it impossible to engage, to embrace a new form of religion. That would lose their authority, their ability to rule, the riches that they possessed. Jesus came, and he came for a purpose, and that purpose was to do away with the religious garbage of the day, to get rid of the legalism, to get rid of the arrogance, and to develop within our life a new way, a way of forgiveness and the way of grace. Caiaphas was a puppet. Caiaphas did pronounce Jesus guilty, but only because God had a redemptive plan. Let me tell you about that plan. Let me tell you about a young lady that was in sin, that was possessed, but she encountered Jesus. And she is going to tell you, once you encounter Jesus, everything changes. Listen to Mary as she tells us her story. They don't have my word. Everyone knew who I was. Seven demons, people would whisper. Mary Magdalene is possessed with seven demons. You have no idea what I suffered. The torment, the rejection, the sin. My life was like the darkest night when not even the moon casts its glow to light the way. There was no one to help me. No one cared. But then, one day, Jesus came into my life. He claimed to be Messiah, the Son of God himself. He said he had the power on earth to forgive sins. Here at last was the one, the only one, who could lift me out of the dungeon of despair which I had sunk into. He was the only one who could pardon my sin and exchange my night for day, my dark for light, my sin for his righteousness, and my eternal punishment for his eternal life. Yes, I believed what he said. In, in faith, believing that he was indeed the Christ, I asked him to forgive me. I begged him to free me from the seven demons that haunted me. It, it happened that very moment. They were gone, and my life was never the same from that day on. I followed him wherever he went. I was always in the crowd when he taught. He raised people from the dead. He would heal the sick. The deaf would hear. The lame would walk. The dumb would speak. Those bound by evil spirits were released by his command. I was one of several women who followed him. We were not as close to him as, as the others. The, the, the 12 disciples, Peter and, and Andrew and James and John. But we constantly felt the warmth of his smile and the gentleness of his voice. He loved us just as much as we loved him. But then the leaders in Jerusalem arrested him and killed him. And I stood at the cross and I watched him die. I wept to see him suffer. The Roman soldiers were so cruel and our leaders were no better. The chief priests, scribes mocked him in his agony and they hated him. But Jesus had told us beforehand that this was the hour for which the Father had sent him. He said that he was laying down his own life on his accord. No one was taking it from him. We stayed there all day. From the morning when they drove the nails 
and his hands and his feet into the cross until that evening when the soldier drove a spear into his side. Three days later, I was standing outside the empty tomb weeping when I heard a man ask, Woman, why are you weeping? I thought it was the gardener. And so I asked, Sir, what have you done with him? It was fully light, but tears blurred my eyes. I turned, but I couldn't see clearly. Then he called me by my name, Miriam. That was my Aramaic name, the name that only my parents and my friends called me. A gardener wouldn't have spoken Aramaic to me. A Roman wouldn't have known my name. I knew that voice. I looked up and it was him. It was Jesus. And I answered in Aramaic, Rav and I, and I threw myself at his feet. I was weeping and I was laughing, not believing and believing. My master, my teacher, my savior, my Lord, he was standing there alive. The events of those last few days began to all make sense to me. See, Jesus had purposely allowed himself to be delivered into the hands of angry men. He had given himself willingly as a payment for their sins and for mine. His resurrection proved beyond any doubt that he was indeed the Christ. He was the son of the living God, and the forgiveness that he had bestowed upon me was of God himself. Wow, that application is very simple. Once you encounter Jesus, once you have experienced Jesus' forgiveness, once you have been liberated from your past, you can't take your eyes, your heart, and your devotion off of him. Mary is very distinct because in her life, in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, it records that Mary was one of the only three people at the foot of the cross that loved Jesus. John, Jesus' mother, Jesus' disciple, Mary, his mother, and Mary, the one that was delivered, that had experienced the torment, the depression, the sadness, of pain, but then experience the joy of forgiveness. Have you been there? Have you been in the dumps? Have you tried everything yourself? And you feel like there's no hope, there's no way, but yet you give your life, your sin, your soul to Jesus and experience the liberation the forgiveness and the freedom. So then you can look at that cross that Jesus died on and said, I can glory in nothing but the cross. Because the cross is what transferred, transformed her life and your life. Then I can look at Galatians chapter 6 and I can look at that because of what Jesus did for me, what Jesus did for you, what Jesus did for her, and say, there's nothing that made a difference in my life more than anything other than that cross. I'm not gonna glory in anything. I'm gonna take respect and reverence in that cross. But yet there's another character a very sad character, a person that was chosen by God, chosen to walk, chosen to take care of the resources, witnessed the miracles, witnessed Jesus, understood that he was the I am, the perfect lamb, knew no sin, but still looked at what he wanted 
what he desired more than what Jesus desired. And he took his own life, his own will, his own way, took it to the high priest, and you know the story. He betrayed Jesus. Judas, a man that we all have heard of, and a man that is very sad in his own life. Judas. I, I stand at the edge of a cliff. <laughs> this rope tied around my neck. The other end to the limb of a tree. Dark thoughts fill my mind. And I wonder what has come over me. I should have been a leader. I was named Judas, after the great patriarch, Judah, first among the twelve tribes of Israel. I should have been first among the disciples, not Peter. But there is no other way. I, I have done unspeakable things. I betrayed my master. I deserve to die. Yes, and that will be the end. At least then, no one will ever be able to use me. The religious leaders tried to use me. All they wanted was an opportunity to arrest Jesus without creating a riot. Well, I gave them that opportunity, and they used me, and they paid me off. I thought Jesus wanted to use me also. I wanted, he wanted to use me to build his kingdom. And he wanted to change me. I could see it in his eyes every time the money box would come up short. Jesus knew I was stealing money. He knew all about me. And he should have hated me. I could fool everyone, but not him. And I just grew to hate him. But this tree and this cliff, it will put an end to all of their plans. He wanted me, but only on his terms. I will not belong to another. I will not be the possession of anyone. Well... I shall not be used by him now. No more errand boy and no more teacher's helper. No one can help him now because they have him. It all came to me at Passover. We gathered in an upper room to celebrate the feast. I was overwhelmed with sudden clear purpose. It was an amazing strength of resolve. I could see it all coming together. It would be easy. I knew what I had been made for. It was all too perfect. The conversation around the table about the week's festival, one or two had something to say about the interfering Romans. But most of the talk was about the faithfulness of God who redeemed Israel a long time ago. I was silent. Jesus caught my eye a few times, but I looked away. And then Jesus interrupted the conversation by announcing that one of us would betray him. The room, it was instantly still. The faces around the to table showed stunned amazement. Of course, everyone had heard talk that the leaders of the council would pay for information leading to Jesus' arrest, but none of them imagined that anyone would ever betray the Master. One by one, 
each disciple asked if he were the one. I asked also, of course. But low voices rang the table in, in worried discussion. The meal progressed. As I dipped my hand into the dish, Jesus said something to the two next to him. Peter and John. They looked at me with worried faces. And I knew he had told them. And I don't know how he knew, but I had already been to the chief priest and offered to betray Jesus. Somehow he must have known about it. I had to get out of there. I stood and rushed out of the room. It was time. I expected them to go to the Garden of Gethsemane after dinner. Whenever we visited Jerusalem, that was his favorite place. He loved the solitude for prayer. I went straight to the chief priests and told them to hurry. If the other disciples guessed my plans, they might spoil everything. We must act now, I said. They agreed. Some went to get the temple police. The rest of us went to the Roman garrison where the priests requested a contingent of soldiers to accompany us. I led the way. It was exhilarating. I was in command. No one using me. Everyone following me. I had the power. And when we got to the garden, as I expected, Jesus was praying. The others had fallen asleep. Jesus heard us coming, and he roused the disciples. I stepped forward from the shadows. It was dark, and the torches did not provide much light. I had arranged a signal to identify Jesus in the darkness. I kissed him on the cheek and greeted him. Rabbi, I had greeted him that way a hundred times. We all had. And with a simple daily habit, an innocent token of greeting, I betrayed the Master. He always wanted to be the Master, to be served. For all his talk about serving others, he always was the Master, as though he had been born king or something. Well, now they have him. I wonder what kind of kingdom he'll inherit. It's one thing to lead a few disciples and country peasants when the sun shines on the hillside. But see if anyone follows him when night has come and all is darkness. Nobody can rule from a cross. Now, finally, in this act, I am free. Not being used by anyone. Free. A rope around my neck. Standing at the edge of this cliff. Soon, I'll be free. And yet, I wonder, can a man's death solve anything? I mean, if a man gives himself to death freely, no one taking it from him. Can one who gives himself to death accomplish anything? Can a dead man hanging on a tree serve any purpose? Well, I'm going to find out. Because I'm just one step from freedom. when we look at the Easter story. Of course, one of the names that always comes to light is Judas, the betrayer of Jesus. He took his own life. But the whole unique story, I believe, in that is he didn't stand out. When they were in the upper room, absorbing the Lord's Supper, communion, and Jesus told his disciples, one of you. They didn't look at G Judas and point their finger. 
They didn't say it was going to be you. He didn't stand out as somebody different. He blended into the crowd. He was normal. The application is, we can lie to anyone. We can lie to everyone. But we cannot lie to God. But see, when he said that Jesus looked at him, that Jesus realized what he had done, stole from the treasury, took a bribe, Jesus knew his heart. He could blend in with people. But you can't blend in with God. And that torment within his life, the ability to give what he wanted is to be the leader, ultimately caused his death. Because of that pride, Judas would not ask for forgiveness, which I believe Jesus would have freely given to him. But he decided that his act of hatred towards Jesus, to betray him, to be crucified, was so overwhelming within his soul, he would rather go to the grave in his sin than to experience God's forgiveness. And it's so sad that we see people today that do that same thing. We try to blend in without acceptance of Jesus. We would rather go to our grave without Jesus than to admit I have sinned or I have betrayed. Because Judas is no different than you and no different than me. I betrayed Jesus. I've said his name in vain. I've done things that he did not approve of. I am a betrayer. I am a Judas. There's one difference between Judas Iscariot and Bruce Thomas. You know what that difference is? I bent my knee before the cross. And I said, Lord, I need your forgiveness. I need it. I can't go through life and clearly can't go through death without encountering the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when his arms were open wide, he looked at this pitiful individual and he said, you are forgiven. You're pardoned. As if you've never sinned. As if Mary Magdalene never sinned. As if I was loved. I didn't have to go through my life trying to blend in. I didn't have to stand at the cliff of death and hope that I was going to be okay. I knew that because of the radical love of Jesus within my life, I am forgiven. Are you a Judas that hold everything in? That's hoping nobody sees? That's hoping everybody thinks that you are okay? Or will you be Somebody that's open and honest before God and say, I can't do this any longer. I can't live my life for myself and I need to encounter Jesus. I need to encounter forgiveness. I need his forgiveness. Because we're all going to encounter the cross. We're all going to stand before Jesus. We will all bend our knee one day, whether it is here in a church service, at your bed, at a camp, or at the throne of God, one day you will stand before Jesus. Let me tell you the difference. Today, when you stand before Jesus, he is going to be your loving Savior, forgiver, and provider. Because he died for you. If you stand before him at the throne, he is going to be your judge. And because of your sin that has not been forgiven, he has to pronounce you guilty. Depart from me. But today, if you accept him, he's going to open his arms up 
and said, innocent because of me. I want my Lord to be my Savior, not my judge. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you and we do encounter the cross. Whether it's as Caiaphas, as a religious leader, to condemn, or it may be Mary that looked at the cross in amazement and wonder because of what Jesus has done for her. Or we may be just like Judas, trying to be the leader, trying to blend in, trying to just get by. But when Jesus looks deep within his soul, within our soul, he sees the truth. And that truth, whether we have a relationship with Jesus or not, isn't about what man believes, what family thinks. It's all about what Jesus knows. And Jesus knows whether we're his child. He knows if we've encountered the cross. Lord, so today, convict us. Help us. Help us encounter the cross from a different aspect. Not our will, but your will. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you over the next few weeks, as we encounter the cross in these different characters, that they're going to come out. I want to get you to put your soul, your heart, and your life into the event. Which character do you represent the most? In Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, it says, I cannot glory in anything but the cross. Our life, our family, our resources, our church. It's all about Jesus. It's about what he did. He died on the cross for your sins and mine. As long as we focus on Jesus, as long as we focus on the cross, as long as we can say, because of Jesus, I am alive. Because of Jesus, I am forgiven. We have a story to tell. We have a purpose to live. Because whenever we hear about Easter, whenever we witness a cross, whether it's on the body, around the neck, or in a picture, we can say, that event changed my life. And I pray over the next four weeks that each and every one of us, when we look at that cross, we can say that event that took place upon that cross, my Lord, my Savior, died for me. He shed his blood to cover my sins. I am who I am because he did what he did. I can glory in nothing but the cross. That is the Christian perspective. That is my perspective. We are nothing without Jesus. And he did everything on the cross for you and for me. Can we not glory in anything other than the cross. God bless you. Pastor Al.